Hey guys, Big Green here. Sorry if I sound a bit fucked just to start. I just had my tonsils removed earlier this week and I can't talk properly still. So enjoy the weird pedo Michael Jackson for a moment, I guess. Um, but before we get started into the comp, I just thought I'd let you know of a couple major things uh, regarding just my whole persona, I guess. One, as the title says, this is a part one, which means that this will be a semi-annual thing, which will be a part two later on on the year. Two, I now have a gaming channel, which you should really check out. There's a video on it already, and the plan is to release a video on that channel once a week. Put a lot of effort into the video that's already on there. It took me like fucking 10 hours to edit or something retarded. But yeah, you should really check it out. It meant a lot if you did. Uh, three, just as a shameless quick plug, you should also follow some of me on all my socials because I really like the ego boost. <laughs> I post different stuff on each, so check them all out. That's about it. Enjoy the video. Furry encounter thread. I'll start. Be me. About 16 at the time. Socially awkward kid at the time. No GF, and only two friends. After school in the library, I'm sitting there with my friends playing video on my laptop. Guy behind me recognizes the game. Wow, Anon! I didn't know you played video games! Do you want to play with me? Let's just call this kid Snowflake. I see Snowflake sometimes. He's a real nice dude and very smart. He has a GF and is basically a chad without muscles. Surprised by this and say yes. My friends let me and he gets out of his laptop. We play Vidya for about 3 hours, with my friends joining in and about 30 minutes in. It's getting really late Anon. Do you want my phone number? Get his number and he leaves. Shortly after, walk home with my friends. As soon as I get there, I call him. We play Vidya until almost 2am and eventually we fall asleep. Fast forward 2 days. Snowflake invites me over to his house. Agree immediately and I'm really excited. This guy's made me feel less like a social outcast. Fast forward about two hours after school. Head to his house. His parents are very nice and offer me drinks. Say no and walk upstairs. At first, everything is dandy. His room smells nice, is well kept, except for a few dust bunnies here and there. Shit hits the fan when he pulls out pick related. Immediately think I shouldn't be there. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Snowflake, uh, uh, I just remembered I have to go home and finish homework. Oh, come on, Anon. Can't you do it tomorrow? Uh, no. I have to really get it done. It's really important. Don't even have homework. Well, okay, if you say so. But stay for a minute so I can tell you about my persona. Oh, fuck. Okay, I guess. Thanks for being so accepting towards me, Anon. I get bullied all the time for being a fairy. I thought maybe you were going to punch me. Feels bad, man, though, JPEG. Stay there for a little while willingly to hear about his fursona. His fursona's name is Snowflake, and he's a white wolf. He tells me that I'm the only real friend he ever had. What about your girlfriend? He says she doesn't know, and plans on never telling her. Decide to confront him. He shows me his drawings. They're really bad, but I still like them. Snowflake asks me, Be honest with me, Anon. Do you still want to be my friend? Thinking.jpg Yeah, dude. You're cool. Expression turns into happiness. We become really good friends. Tell my other friends that I spent the whole time playing Dark Souls with him, and don't mention he's a fairy part at all. Fast forward three years. We both graduate out of the same college. Both have a shitty minimum wage jobs. Eventually, save up enough money together to buy a fursuit for him. Looks kinda like pick related, but by a different maker. Still not a fairy, but Snowflake, if you're reading this, you taught me a good lesson. Fairies are fucking tards, but they have hearts too, I guess. Be me. 31. Average build, average looking. 6 out of 10 for sure. Could probably bump it up to a 7 out of 10 if I dress nicer. Chat with a super cute barista at a Starbucks when I order coffee. Simple stuff, like what I do for work, etc. I love the outdoors, getting out to a nice peaceful quiet place. My dog just had puppies. I work as a birthday clown part time. She gives me a weird look. Oh shit, I fucked up. I play it off like it was a joke, with a very light chuckle as I continue on. But my real job is as a private investigator. She goes back to smiling. I think I unfucked up my fuck up. She seems genuinely interested. Want to ask her out, but I'm super nervous. If she says no, I can never order coffee here again. Maybe next time. Ask a friend for advice. Tell him about her and my worries. Just go for it. If she says no, who gives a fuck? There's another coffee shop on the other side of the street. That's a good point, .jpg. It's settled. 
Time to man up and go for it. Two days later. Stump a coffee. This is it. Time to ask her out. Get to the front of the line. What a coffee. Chat a moment. Ask her if she has any cool weekend plans. Nope. Nothing really. <laughs> Me neither. I bitch out. Too nervous. Can't do it. I start walking away, but something in me snaps. I go on full fuck it mode. Balls activated EXE. Walk back in. You know what? Neither of us have weekend plans, and you're super cute. Why don't you let me take you out on a date? <laughs> sure, Nun, I'd love that. My brain just skipped a beat. Did that really just fucking happen? Holy fuck balls! I did it! G great! Uh, should I come back to pick you up, or would you like to meet somewhere? We chat for a moment, until the customer behind me seems irritated. We exchange numbers, and I leave. I'm in cloud nine. Third time I've ever asked a girl out. First one to say yes. Text her, and make plans later on. I'm gonna pick her up at 9am, from her parents' place, and we're gonna go on a hike. She knows a cool trail, just up the road, and we will get lunch afterwards. This is gonna be perfect. The weekend cometh. So excited. Date day is finally here. Go outside. All of my car windows are smashed. Are you fucking kidding me, Dotwev? Give her a call. Tell her my car got vandalized. Gonna file a police report. I'm gonna be late. She's super cool about it. Genuinely feels bad. It cheers me up a bit. Cops come, we go through the process. If you've ever experienced something similar yourself, you know how shitty and violated it makes you feel. I hope you catch the motherfuckers who did this! My neighbor came out to see what all the commotion was about. His shirt is unbuttoned and flapping in the wind, allowing his hairy beer gut to hang out in all of its glory, displaying his Trump 2016 tattoo. He looks at my destroyed car, takes a big gulp of his Bud Light. It was probably N-words. It probably was, but I wasn't going to blurt it out like that. The sergeant turns to me. It probably was, but I wouldn't have yelled it in public like that. We both almost laugh before that horrible feeling of being wronged returned to me. Cops leave. I leave. No other option than to take my van to work now. Can't drive my car. She lives fairly close by, and I text her when I arrive. She comes out. Her rockin' body is showed off in a tight workout clothes she's wearing for the hike. She seems to hesitate when she gets next to my van. Why are you driving a creeper van, Anon? It's not a creeper van. It's just my work van. My car is fucked. Why does it say free candy on the side? What? Get out of my van and go look. Sure as shit, the fuckers who got my car spray painted free candy on the side of my van. Are you fucking kidding me, JPEG? I let out a flurry of curse words. Her face looks like she's starting to have second thoughts. I apologize. She says it's okay. Let's just go blow off some steam with a hike. Thank God. I help her in and I go around to my side. I get in and she looks nervous. What's wrong? What? What? What's all that stuff back there? Oh, it's just some of my work stuff and clutter. I need to organize and throw it away. Shit, she sees how untidy I am now. Her eyes get white as fuck, as I could physically see her heartbeat must have been at a hummingbird level. She slowly turned her head and looked at me. Is... is that blood, Anon? What are you fucking talking about, the JPEG? I turned around to look in the cargo area. It was just my work stuff, some tools, and a rug that I'd been forgetting to throw away. Then it clicked. A dirty old shovel, gloves, rusty screwdrivers, my birthday party clown costumes, files and pictures of missing children that I've been investigating, the blood-stained rolled-up rug that my dog gave birth on. Panicked at AXE. It's not what it looks like! She screams bloody murder and runs from the van. I chase after her yelling, It's not what you think! I'm not a killer! Her dad comes running out of the house with a kitchen knife wearing only his boxes. She's screaming so loud you can't make out the words. Her dad comes after me. I book it to the van. I get inside and lock it just before he can get me. He's screaming and yelling, I'll fucking kill you, psycho! Hacks off my side view mirror. I speed off. Holy fuck what just happened. My heart is racing. And that's why I exclusively buy coffee from Dutch Bros. Where do you guys like to get coffee from? I will now tell you the story of Pickle. Imagine a skinny autistic kid with glasses, a big June nose, and n-word hair. Pube head. This fag was known for being the biggest show off in high school. My face on this motherfucker cut off his big Jew nose from doing pull-ups on a fence arch because he wanted to warm up for football. And word, we were playing football with this freshman. I have a lot of stories, but I'm going to start with the day after spring break. B17. PE about to start. 
Coach hasn't come out yet, so I'm standing out in our roll call numbers. First one to come out of the locker room. Pickles the Jew comes out. Hey, Nan, how was the spring break? Think in my mind the only reason he's asking me is because he wants to tell me what he did. Humor him and see what he says. Just went hiking and surfing mostly. What about you? Oh, I've been working out. Oh boy, here we go to PNG. Slash fit kicks in. Ask him what kind of exercises he does. He starts stuttering. Uh, um, y you know, uh... I say, so what, like weightlifting? Y yeah, of course, C core workouts. Uh, that's cool. Where do you go? You know the gym near the plaza? I take the strength course over there. This N-word takes core classes with his mum at Crunch Fitness. They don't offer any other courses over there. He starts to flex in front of me. Cutie Pie Girl walks out of the girls' locker room and stands on her number. We'll call her Jenny. Pickles wants to show off. He stares at Jenny while rubbing his biceps. Hey mum, wanna do some pull-ups? Is this N-word serious? Humor him again because I know where this is going. Where? Over here. He points to a fence in the doorway where he cut his Jew nose. His blood is still on it. Jenny's number is right in front of the fence doorway. He walks over to the doorway, making sure him and Jenny make eye contact. Jenny looks at him with a blank stare, then looks over at me. She knows Pickles likes her. She's always making fun of him and talks about him a lot with me. She looks at me smiling. She knows that Pickles wants to show off. I ask Pickles, Yo, how many do you want to do? I don't know, just enough to get the blood pumping. We have a sub, so all we're gonna do is play flag football with the freshmen again. Jenny is standing next to me now, along with a couple of her friends. Pickles is facing us, and actually warns us that he's been working out a lot, so he might not do as many pull-ups because he's still sore. Pickles had the weakest arms in high school. He jumps up and starts doing pull-ups, wheezing every time he comes up. He doesn't look at us. He stares ahead. This n-word does 15 pull-ups, sweating and breathing heavily, and says it's my turn. Nah man, I can't beat that. He brags about how he can bench 45 and calls me weak. I try not to do pull-ups because I don't want to catch tinnitus. He says, I mean, if you're weak and on, it's okay. Slash Fred kicks in again. I see visions of Scoobs. I ponder if I should do pull-ups. Ziz looks on. He whispers to me, Destroy him. Scoobs puts his hand on my shoulder and points to the fence doorway. I don't want to shame him. Tell Pickles. Sure. Walk up. Crank out 40 pull-ups. Halfway through, I can hear Zaz shouting at me. I stop at 45 and look at Pickles in the eye. He doesn't return my look. Fairly sure Jenny is wet now. She wants to feel my muscles to make Pickles jealous. Ask Pickles, I thought you've been working out. He stutters something. He walks away, saying he needs some water. See tears running down his face from embarrassment. Jenny, her friends and I start bursting into laughter. Bros come out of the locker room, tell them what happened. They start laughing. I start laughing. Jenny starts laughing. The coach next to us starts laughing. Soon the whole class is laughing because Pickles started crying. Our coach comes out. Wants to know why we're laughing. We all look at Pickles, his head hung in shame. Coach looks at him. Says, Oh, sake. We stretch and head out to run our warm-up laps. Me and my bros are usually at the front of the class. Halfway out, we hear what sounded like a pig grasping for air. It's Pickles. He's sprinting. Me and my bros look back, look at each other, then start to sprint. Pickles tries to catch up, stops to walk. Hear him say, I'm gonna stop. I, do, I don't want to waste my energy. Jenny runs past him on third lap. He tries to catch up to us, still at the front. He finishes behind us. That was a good workout. My bros tells him to shut up. Pickles tells him in a passive aggressive voice to calm down. My bro tells him to stop showing up in front of Jenny because it's pathetic. Jenny stands next to me. Pickles is in, a sp Pickles is in the spotlight. We're all waiting for his reply. He looks at us, then stops at Jenny. Jenny is standing there with her arms crossed. Pickles walks away, defeated. Half annoyed, we all grab a football and start a junior only game. This is where the story really gets good. We pick teams. Pickle wants to be the team captain. <laughs> Lol, no.png. He gets assigned to Hiker. First down, he hikes it to a mile above the QB's head. He gets laughed at by the entire class. Jenny is laughing her ass off. We get the ball and he wants to cover me. I get ball and barrel past Pickles. This N-word actually tries to claw my leg with his rat paws. Bro, it's just a game, calm down! He doesn't say anything. Next play, he tries to tackle me. I don't even have the ball. 
He starts to try and push me down, hands on my shoulders. Bro, what are you doing? I don't have the ball. He doesn't say anything. He's weak as tits. He's trying to handle me. Gets annoyed because he's stretching my $8 PE shirt. Bro, stop. I'm serious. Don't put your hands on me. He says nothing. Get tired of this. Grab him and push him to the ground. He gets up yelling. He wants to play tackle. Okie dokie. Tell my bro to hand the ball to me. Third down and Pickles lines up in front of me. And ask Jenny to watch. Get ball and knock Pickles off his feet. Score touchdown. I shit you not, he walks over to the benches, sits next to Jenny, saying that I'm a pig for taking the game too seriously. She starts to shuffle away from him. Other team wants to know why Pickles isn't playing anymore. Bad shoulder. Block period, so we all take a break halfway through the period. All sitting on the benches now. Pickles is sitting next to a visibly uncomfortable Jenny. My bro teases Jenny, saying that she leads guys on too much or something. Pickles' full-on shining knight armor tells him to shut up. Jenny sarcastically thanks Pickles. He says, That's alright Jenny, I know how you feel. Gentlemen are a dying breed. I tell him to shut up. Jenny playfully grabs his hand and says that she appreciates it. Pickles gets a fucking boner. His rocket bulging out of his pants. Jenny doesn't notice at first, but when she does, she breaks into laughter and looks away. We're all laughing under our breath now. None of us says anything. Jenny gets up, saying that she needs water. We can hear her laughing with her friends. Biggle asks me to sit next to him. This n still has a full-fledged boner. Why? What's up? I want to ask you something. Some people got to go up to play soccer with the freshmen or get some water, so it's only Pickles, me, and a couple of my bros at the benches. Anon, can you give me advice? But you just fucking ruined my fucking expensive PE uniform. Think what's going on. Get up and stand near him. Think fuck his bone is gone. I think Jenny likes me. Oh shit. Really, Pickles? I'm not sure. Yeah, Anon. Did you see how she touched me? I think she loves me. This M1 is in love because Jenny touched his hand. You sure, Pickles? Me and my friends want to see where this is going, so they play along with me. My bro sits next to him and says, Yeah, Pickles, I think she's really into you. Pickles asks us how to talk to her. At that moment, Jenny and everyone comes back. I sit where Jenny used to sit, and everyone sits down again to relax. Jenny looks at me, then at Pickles, who is smiling at her. Pickles tells me to move because Jenny was sitting there first. Jenny laughs and says that it's fine, then proceeds to sit on my lap. Pickles looks dumbfounded. Pickles gets a boner because his eyes are at a tit level. Jenny notices Pickles staring, so she attempts to get him mad. She starts squirming on my lap, almost grinding, trying to get comfortable. Jenny turns her head and looks at me smiling. Pickles is pissed off. Pickles the Jew has had enough. He says, Alright, enough is enough. He says I should get up and be a gentleman. I don't know what to say. He stands up. Pickles is weird because sometimes he's angry at me and sometimes he wants to be my best friend. Anon, get up. Why? Just get up. Get a little annoyed because I was enjoying the semi-lap dance and the fact that we were both wearing the thick PE shorts. Alright. What? He starts fucking lecturing me. She is a woman, Anon, and she deserves respect. I bet she's pissed off that she has to put up with your shit. He looks at Jenny for assurance. Jenny looks at both of us confused. He starts talking about injustice among the gender and how I should have gotten up to let her sit. He looks at me. I'm just standing there. He laughs at me, saying I don't understand a word he's saying. He says I'm too dumb to understand it. Have enough of his shit. Sit back down next to Jenny in Pickle's spot. Pickles asks Jenny to stand up because she shouldn't have to deal with me. Getting annoyed, I put my arm around Jenny to piss him off. Pickles is furious. He tells me not to touch his lady. Jenny is sitting there, laughing quietly. I tell him to stop being mad because he can't talk to girls. Pickles has had enough of my shit. He walks up to go get some water. I think Pickles is bipolar. He's normal and has good grades, but he doesn't really cue on to social signs. Everyone is just laughing at Pickles' shenanigans. Jenny says she doesn't understand how Pickles doesn't get it. She says he started texting her over the break. She says she never gave him her number. My bro later told me that Pickles got a number from a contact sheet that she found when Pickles helped out the attendance office. She said that Pickles texted her a total of 57 messages. Each one was him asking her to Starbucks. She doesn't know how to respond, so she tried to ignore him. It didn't work. Pickles at texted her 10 times each day over the spring break. She wanted to ask Pickles about it, but she said she didn't know how. I tell her I'll ask him about it later. Pickles comes back, and he's trip over to the fountain 
he hatches a genius plan to win over Jenny. He wants to sing for her. I shit you not, he comes back and doesn't say a word to any of us. He calmly walks up to me and Jenny. I put my arm down. He looks serious. Jenny, I want you to know how much I cherish you. I want you to know that every day I passed you in the halls, I froze up because of your beauty. I can't stand this anymore. I need to ask you something. Jenny looks almost afraid. No one is laughing. Why honestly didn't know how to react to the situation? He takes her knee. He grabs Jenny's hand and looks into her eyes. Quietly, he starts to sing his heart out to Jenny. Oh, Jenny, sweet, beautiful angel. Ooh, how my love can no longer be expressed. What the fuck is going on? This isn't real. He starts rapping out of fucking nowhere. Jenny, I love you so much. Will you let me buy you lunch? My heart wants you. I picked up your clue. You touched my hand. You're the greatest in all the land. I think of all the fun we'll have in the sun. If you say yes, if you'd leave me in the mess. This isn't fucking real. It isn't. I wonder if the simulation is broken. Ask the aliens what's going on. He gets up and says, Well, Jenny, what's your answer? It's silent. No one says anything. No one is laughing. We all look at Jenny, confused. He stands there, waiting for an answer. What a loser. Well, Jenny? What a fucking weenie! Everyone turns to my black friend. You're such a fucking loser, Pickles. What the fuck is wrong with you, you fucking moron? She doesn't fucking like you. And we're over here singing and shit. This ain't a frozen N-word. Y'all coming over here, big and bad. N-word, who you think you is? Bitch, N-word, be thinking it's a fairy tale. Well, it ain't, so leave her alone. Pickles is silent. He can't handle the Detroit Nignog. He starts tearing up. Jenny starts feeling sorry for him. You guys are so mean. Aw, oh, it's okay, Pickles. I thought it was cute. But I need you to understand. I don't have feelings for you, okay? She gets up to hug him. Pickles still hasn't said anything. We're all sitting down. Jenny is just standing there, hugging Pickles. Awkward as shit. Jenny is face me. She mouths, what do I do? I stand up, trying to make sense of this anomaly. She lets go of Pickles. Pickles doesn't let go. We're still silent. Jenny looks at me and mouths, Bona. Her arms are at her side at this point. Alright, at this point I feel sorry for him and annoyed at him. Pickles finally lets go. He grabs Jenny's hand and walks her away from us. She doubtfully goes with him. She turns back and looks at me scared. What the fuck is going on? I turn to my black friend. Bro, that was kind of fucked up. Other bros agree. Nick Nog visibly feels bad. Yeah, it was too much. But he needs to understand. Jenny's friends are asking me to go over there and handle it. What? I think Pickles is going to rape Jenny or some shit. Alright. I walk around the corner, and Pickles has his fucking shirt off, hugging Jenny. I don't understand what's happening. Jenny sees me, and gets Pickles off her, and walks towards me. She whispers for us to go. I ask what happened. She says she'll tell me later. I turn to Pickles. His eyes are red and watery. He just looks at me and walks past me and Jenny. He has a determined look on his face. Oh shit, Pickles, what's going on? Jenny tells me Pickles now wants to fight the Nicknog. We'll name the Nicknog Maurice. I ask her if she's alright and if she got any jaw on her. She says she's fine. We walk back to the benches. Pickles is doing the slow walk. Arms up, shirt off. I want to let this happen, but I can't because Jenny is there. She says she thinks that Pickles is annoying, but doesn't want him to get hurt. Are you fucking shitting me? She wants me to stop it. Tell her I want to see the Jew get wrecked. No, Anon, do something. I say I'll try. Fuck that. I want to see this faggot get his shit punched in. He ruined my PE uniform. Eight dollars is a lot of money. We turn the corner in time to see it happen. Pickles is in Maurice's face. Pickles is standing. Maurice is sitting. Pickles is shouting at this point, calling him an unintelligent monkey. Maurice doesn't give a shit. He won't give in. Walk over. Me and Jenny are standing behind Pickles. He is full on screaming in his face. Wonder how the coach hasn't heard any of this. Pickles is going on about how Maurice shouldn't have even been allowed to attend our school. He calls Maurice a shifty headed ape. I don't know. I enjoy myself a little. Jenny is nudging my arm, telling me to calm him down. Things start heating up when Pickles starts smacking him. At this point, I'd like to point out that me and my bros were really athletic. 
so me and my bros were pretty fit and built. So imagine a scrawny Jew with his shirt off, trying to push out my black friend Maurice. You can see why I chose to let it happen for a bit. Now, Maurice didn't really want to hurt him, so he just sits there and swats Pickles' hands away. Things didn't look that bad, except when Pickles made a mistake. Pickles insults Maurice by saying he was raised by his shit-faced retarded grandma. Pickles, you fool! Maurice gets up, and it's like a scene in a movie. Maurice gets up, and, like a scene in a movie, gets in Pickles' face saying, What did you say? Maurice's grandmother raised him all his life. He worked through it for a long time in order to support your medical bills. She died three months ago. Maurice pushes Pickles into the fence. What the fuck did you just fucking say about me, little bitch? I'll have you know that I graduated the top of my class in the Navy SEALs and I've been involved in numerous secret raids in Al Qaeda. I have over 300 confirmed kills, I'm a trained guerrilla warfare, and I'm the top sniper in the entire US Armed Forces. I will wipe you the fuck out with a precision with the likes that has never been seen before on this earth. Mark my fucking words. You think you can get away with saying this shit to me over the internet? Think again, fucker. As we speak, I'm contacting my secret network of spies across the US, and your IP has been traced right now, so you better be prepared for the shitstorm, maggot. That storm that wipes out the pathetic little thing you called your life. You're fucking dead, kid. I can be anywhere, anytime. I can kill you over 700 ways, and that's just with my bare hands. I could end it there, but I'm not. Just quickly before I start, I am still a little bit sick. Uh, I've been pretty munted this entire week. So, yeah, if I do sound a bit weird, that's why, but I still want to get this to you guys, and I'm going to try my best. Maurice pushes him to the fence. I can tell he's deciding on whether or not to beat Pickles up for what he said. Pickles keeps trying to move away from the fence, but Maurice just keeps pushing him back. I can tell Pickles was hurt, because he wasn't wearing a shirt, and Maurice knew this too. Hey, Maurice, come tell, man. He's not worth it. I tell him the usual cliche type stuff, because I know he's mad. Maurice ignores me, and holds Pickles against the fence with one hand. Pickles, listen here, you fucking skinny piece of shit. Don't you dare disrespect my mama. Oh shit, it's kicking off. She worked her ass off trying to keep a roof over my head. Pickles has his hands up, cowering, trying to cover his face. Yo, Maurice, calm down, man. I have the fucking right to beat this motherfucking sorry ass. Did you hear this badass little kid? I ought to slap your shit, you fucking pussy! Maurice, man, calm down, he ain't worth it, man. It's quiet. We're near the corner of the field, so I don't anyone could hear us when Maurice was screaming. Who the fuck you think I am? I don't know where this is going. Jenny is standing next to me, silent. Pickle starts talking. He's sobbing at this point. He's actually begging Maurice to let him go. Like a fucking movie, the bell rings right when Maurice is about to punch him. He lets go of Pickles, walks away angry. A couple of my bros catch up to him and talk to him. I stay back with Jenny and everyone else to help Pickles, because I felt sorry for him at that point. Everyone kind of feels the same, but also feels that he deserves it. He gets up and tries to calm himself down. He's crying, sweaty, and roughed up. He walks in front of us, saying nothing. He walks to the locker room by himself, shirtless. Jenny hasn't said a work. Everyone is talking about it behind us. Everyone thinks Pickles is an asshole for bringing up Maurice's grandma. Everyone wanted to see Pickles get his ass kicked. Jenny says she felt as though it was her fault. Are you fucking shitting me? Go into locker room to change. See Maurice. He walks by himself, and I ask him if he's cool. He tells me one day, Pickles is going to push him over the edge. Cool beans. Change, walk out, and go have lunch. Jenny waits for me outside, without her friends. Ask what she wants. She wants me to personally talk to Pickles to see if he's alright. Apparently all the girls think that Pickles is the type of kid who would shoot up the school. Get tired of all this Pickles shit. Don't really listen to her. I was hungry as shit, and they were serving pizza. Pizza here tasted like cardboard. Don't care. Pay $2.50 for shitty lunch. Jenny is still talking to me. I don't even notice. See Pickles in line behind me. He looks sad as shit. Face is all roughed up. Point him out to Jenny. Now she's saying she's thinking of going out with him because she feels sorry for him. That's a great idea. Tell her she should, so I can go eat my pizza with the bros. She's still talking. Jenny is hot as fuck. Tight little ass with the cutest face, but she talks too much. I'd fuck the shit out of her, but she talks too much. I'm trying to eat. I'm a grown boy. She's ruining my gains. But she walks up to Pickles and starts talking. I can't hear them over with my gains, so I walk toward the bros. She comes up to me, asks what I should do. Tell her to just end it. She says Pickles wants to marry her. 
<laughs> you fucking serious? Apparently Pickles said today he fought for his love and won. I don't know what to make of this. She says she told him no, but Pickles just keep mumbling to himself. She says she's worried. I tell her it's fine. It gets kind of dark from this point on. Fast forward a couple days. Pickles has been telling everyone his plans. He keeps a journal about his wedding. I'm unsure at this point as to how this is even a real living person. He constantly writes about his special lady in English. Jenny is pissed off at this point. She knows Pickles is telling everyone about how someday they'll kids or something. I tell her to tell him that she doesn't like him. She says nothing works. She says she's been calling her at crazy times. Like 3 in the morning she get calls from him. She says her mum caught some kid in the backyard at night. She assumed it was Jenny's boyfriend trying to sneak in, so they yelled at her about that. Tell her to call the cops. One of her friends jokingly asks to get a restraining order. Ask if she still wants to pity fuck Pickles. Laughs and she says no. Approach Pickles in the morning and ask him what's up. He won't talk to me. I still can't tell if this is real. One day, Jenny comes up to me. She's genuinely scared. Pickles stalks her after school. Oh, that's cool. She's serious. She said he's been sending pictures of him shirtless. I laugh my ass off. I tell her to show him her tits. But things get serious after that. Jenny says Pickles has threatened to kill himself if she doesn't accept his love. I laugh my ass off even more. She tells me to talk to Pickles. What do you want me to do? Talk to him. Tell Jenny to just ignore him and stop teasing the poor kid. She doesn't listen. She sees Pickles walk right past me with his MLP buddy. She hugs Pickles and asks about how his day's been. Pickles gives his buddy a smirk and tells Jenny, It's better now that you're here. Why the fuck am I involved in this? Jenny takes his comment and rubs her face with it. I think she secretly enjoys having a stalker. I don't fucking understand anything. She gives Pickles a kiss on the... and walks away toward me. I see Pickles just stand there, rubbing his cheek where she kissed him, staring at her ass while she walks away. I can see him mouth the words, I love you. I'm pretty sure he jerked off in the bathroom at lunch. I ask what the fuck she's doing. She says she Pickles won't listen to her. Her idea is to just play along until he grows out of it. I tell her she is making a mistake. I tell her it's fucked up. She says says, tried everything, but nothing works. The only reason she kissed him is because he promised to stop call if he kissed him on the cheek. Tell her he's just kinda asked for more. She says she can handle it. She's been asking me for help since the PE situation. Wonder if she's actually going to let Pickles fuck her. Fast forward a week later, the ballad of Pickles marches on. He goes so far to make a shirt with her yearbook picture on him. Me and my bros are just sitting back, laughing our asses off. Jenny is hysterical at this point. She says Pickles wants her to give him a blowjob while he videotapes it. I told you this would happen. She says Pickles has gotten rough with her. She said he surprises her with hugs from behind. Laugh when she says he can feel his boner. She says Pickles wants her to meet her parents. Apparently they had an argument or something about that and Jenny said it was over. Wait, so you did go out with him? I don't know. You fucked up. She says she's legitimately scared now. She says she saw him follow her to her house. Tell her to call the cops before he rapes her. She says she can't. Why the fuck not? Because she has mixed feelings for Pickles. She feels sorry and pissed off. What the fuck do you want me to do then? Get annoyed because she won't listen to anything I say. She says she knows Pickles is going to do something. She said he's going to rape her when he gets a new camera. The only reason Pickles hasn't raped her is because that his mum hasn't bought him a new camera he wanted for Christmas. God, I can't tell if serious. Ask why she won't just call the police. She says she can't. What the fuck do you want me to do? She walked away frustrated. Get slightly worried because Pickles has been acting differently. He's quieter. He doesn't do anything in PE. He always goes to the bathroom and just waits there until period's over. We joke, he just jerks off to Jenny. One of her friends wants to file a report for Jenny. One of my bros talks her out of it saying, it's just Pickles. Getting tired of Jenny coming to me with her pickle problems. We're not fucking, so I don't need to put up with this. Oh, Pickles did this. Oh, Pickles touched me here. One day, get annoyed. Jenny comes up to me in the middle of lunch. I'm sitting there, hanging with the bros, about to go play football. Out of fucking nowhere, it's Pickles. He tries to get friendly with us. Maurice was absent that day, so I guess he saw an opportunity. Hey fellas, you gonna go play football? Uh, yeah bro. Awkward as shit. What the fuck does he want? Can I join in? We look at each other. One of the bros says, Uh, sorry man, no room. Come on guys! 
we realize there's nothing we can do. Either we let him play and just not throw to him, or he follows us and tries to get in the game. Yeah, I guess you can come. We finish eating. Fucking Pickles is throwing our trash away for us. Are you finished with that? L let me get that for you. Oh no, no need to get up. Let me throw that away. What the fuck does he want? We get up, walk to the field to play some catch. Pickles is in the front, fucking wearing Duck Dynasty shirt. Huge backpack. At field, half of us on each side. Just some casual catch. Pickles is on my side. I throw the ball to the other side, and for some reason, Pickles runs it to that side. They throw it to our side, and Pickles runs it to our side. Hey, uh, bro, what are you doing? I'm running plays. Yo, Pickles, we're not doing that. We're just playing catch, man. Five minutes in, he hasn't touched the ball at all. He just stands next to me and put his hands in the direction of the ball. I catch it and toss it to him. Here, bro. Throw one off. It lands two feet in front of him. He's so fucking proud. One of my bros asks him why he's not with Jenny. No, what are you doing? Oh, that's a good idea. I'll go get her. Carlos fucking said that. Fucking Carlos. We talk about ditching the field and playing catch somewhere else, but this is the only day where it's going to be open. Fuck you, Carlos. Here comes Pickles, running back. Jenny is behind him, walking with her friend, looking annoyed as balls. Since Jenny is here, Pickles decides he wants to show off. Now, when they throw it to our side, he tries to intercept me or swat it off my hand. He looks like a fucking frog jumping up and down every throw. Did you see that, Jenny? Hey guys, I think I might get a sports scholarship. Jenny is on the bleachers, with a blank expression. Her friend to her left. She's sitting there where I put my backpack. For fuck's sake, man, I just want to play football. I need to get my backpack because... Ask when I bros to get my backpack, because I don't want to talk to Jenny. They say no. Fuck you, Carlos. Make the slow walk up to the bleachers. Walk up. Make eye contact. She almost looks relieved as me. Hey, Jenny. Hey, Nan. Don't say anything. Look for backpack so I can go on. So Pickles is playing. Yeah. Try not to have a conversation. Hey, Nan. I need to talk to you. Her tone is kind of quiet. Finally find backpack. Start to walk away. Hey, Nan. I need to talk to you. I wanted to ignore her, but I couldn't. Walk back to face her. She gives me this look. I put my stuff down and sit next to her. Okay. She turns to face me. Notice something is wrong. Get the feeling something bad happened. See the look on her face. What's wrong? Long pause. I swear it felt like Pickles had raped her. He, he tried to rape me last night. You're shitting me. Get a sense of anger. What do you mean he tried to rape you? Jenny was annoying. She constantly pissed me off for asking for help. When she said Pickles, that fucking Jew had tried to rape her, it made me angry. Tell me what happened. He offered me to give me a ride on Sunday in his parents' car. It was quiet at first. He pulled me over and asked me to make out with him. I felt bad for getting a free ride with him, so I let him kiss me. He said I'd be his first kiss. I'm shocked, angry, and annoyed at this point. He said he needed more room, so he moved to the back seat. He started kissing me, but then he got violent. He grabbed my shoulders and tried to force me down. He said I owed it to him. He said we were meant to be. I started screaming. He tried to choke me. She parts hairs and shows me her bruise on her neck. She says she was trying to run out of the car when she started to kick him. And on, I don't know what to do. I can't go to the police. I can't go to anyone. The moment she says that, I get up and make my way down to the bleachers. I look up when I reach the base of the bleachers. She's fucking crying. I look back and see him. The fucking scrawny, Juno's coward is holding my football. I make my way toward him. He comes up to me and says, Where were you, Anon? We've been throwing field goals. Without skipping a beat, I pull back my right arm and throw a punch right at this Jew. He tumbles back, arms up. I step forward and push him to the ground. He starts mumbling. I stand over. I lean over him and pull him up slightly by his collar, then proceed to beat the shit out of him. None of my friends intervenes. He puts his hands up, asking what he's done. Pause and look at him. Stand up and face him in Jenny's direction. He turns back. He knows what he did. Walk him over to the bleachers. Throw him on the first bleacher and tell my bro to watch him. Make way to Jenny, right knuckle hurting. Tell her to come down and see him. She looks up and sees me. I point to him at the base of the bleachers. She brightens up, tears running down her face. I walk her down, pull the Jew up and make him face Jenny. He's scared, his eyes are swollen, and nose is still bleeding. I tell him to look her in the eye. Tell him to apologise. He's quiet. He looks at his feet. Grab his chin and make him look at Jenny. 
all of my bros are surrounding him. It's silent. Look her in the eye and apologize. He's still quiet. Punch him in the stomach a couple times. He's crying now. I swear to God, if you just stand there and don't say anything, he pops up and screams he's sorry. He's crying so much his shirt is soaked. Let him go and push him to the ground. I walk away with Jenny. She doesn't say anything, just wraps her arms around me. See bros in distance, everyone getting their bags. Think this about the time she fucks me. Don't care. Ask if she's okay. She wants to let me know that she's thankful for what I did. We just sit there for a while. Bell rings. She's still holding me. She lets go and looks me in the eyes. Say fuck it and just start kissing her. I pull back and walk her across to her class. She wants to meet me after school. Fast forward a week. We're going out, of course. Haven't seen Pickles in a while. Doesn't come to school in a month. Find out he drops out of high school. Cool. Everything peachy now. I beat up the Jew and got to fuck Jenny. No one except Jenny knows why I beat up Pickles. Only my bros know I beat up Pickles. No one knows why Pickles dropped out. The end. Fuck you, slash CK. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you! You didn't tell me this would happen. I thought cooking was supposed to be fun. I'm never doing this fucking bullshit again. Be total retard in the world of cooking. This one fine bitch I want to slam says she likes it when guys cook for her. Decide now is my time. Set up a time for her to come over to my place. Gonna cook her a romantic dinner and shit. She seems excited. A bit before she comes over, I fly do slash CK. Learn what I can in 30 minutes about cooking. Decide I have enough and want to boil some lobsters. Hell fucking yeah. Go over to the market and get four of their finest lobsters. Read somewhere online to bring a chili chest to keep the lobsters in. Do just that. Walk around the store with my delicious friends in their new chili home. Don't know how dumb I look. Bring them home. Have a bit of time before a girl comes over. Decide to make some biscuits as an appetizer. Read somewhere that as a fun family game, you can put coins inside the biscuits and have people break them open. Think I'm gonna get lucky, so I put a condom in hers. Lol, I'm so suave. She arrives. Tell her I'm just about to boil the lobsters. She's obviously unfamiliar with the high art of boiling. Inform her it must be done while they're alive. She's really upset. Assure her that they feel no pain. Put two of them in a pot of water. Want to boil them quickly, so put the flame on high. Leave the kitchen so we can chat it up on the couch. A few minutes pass. Present her with the biscuits. Tell her to break open hers for a surprise. Wink wink. She does. Nothing in hers. Take a big chomp of mine. The most disgusting taste of rubber and plastic fills my mouth. Jesus Christ, it baked into the biscuit. What was I thinking? High-pitched screaming coming from the kitchen. She freaks the fuck out. Ask if the lobsters are screaming. Say, if you were being boiled alive, wouldn't you? Why the fuck did I say that? Smoke starts coming from the kitchen. Oh, fuck. I remember I left the paper bag with the other two lobsters out near the burner. Fly in there. Water is on a rapid fucking boil, sending hot ass water everywhere. Paper bag is on fire. Ah, fuck. Only one lobster is ash. There were two. Where the fuck? One of the lobsters is clear in the hell on the other side of the kitchen. It's rolling and running around to avoid the flame and boiling water. Girl starts screaming. Run up to lobster. Step on it. I am wearing my cleats. Lobster goes everywhere. Girl stops screaming. The room is covered in ash and lobster. She just looks horrified. Look over to her. Decide to just go for it and say, Bon appetit! Wanna fuck? She slaps me and leaves. Tells all her friends who tells all of my friends. Friends now call me Chef Boyardum. Jesus fucking Christ. ITT. We talk about her insane relatives. B16. Cousin is about to go off to college. Family's gathering at Outbacks to grab some food. Solid 15 people in total. Grandparents arrive in a drove. Dear god, the whole fucking works. My grandma and nanny, who can't hear for shit, constantly yelling like, What? What are they selling? Fucking chocolates, nanny. Her brother and sister come in. Great Aunt Maggie is here. Oh boy. Lady sounds like she force-fed herself gravel as a child for fun, along with a heavy Brooklyn accent. Her brother Uncle Nick is blind as fuck and has people walk him around. Sweetest guy ever, but he is a walking disaster because he runs into shit. Dear god, it's him. The Greek god himself. Call him Papa Lee. Man is as Greek as could be, and I will remind you of how good it is to be Greek every time you make eye contact. 
This man and his Greek such broken accent is the reason I can tolerate these family dinners. Waitress comes out with waters. Cousin takes a sip and starts chatting with my mom. Who's sitting next to him? Fucking Zeus, that's who. Grabs my cousin's water while he isn't looking and holds it menacingly. Cousin goes to take a sip and sees Papalini holding it. Give back my shit, thought AVI. Papali yells, BAP! Insert random Greek words here. Man loves to say BAP. No clue what that means. He translates, He who could also live should also learn to live without! And dumps water onto the floor. Waitress sees his shit unfold and just sighs. See the look of disdain on her face. Comes over and asks what's happening as she cleans up the water slash ice. Ma'am, I'm 85 years old, and you know what that means? I'm an octogenarian! I'm so old to do what I do without repercussions! Leans over to me and says, See? A woman should clean up like she's doing now! I rushed the grab to be punks, and fight the man, and do drugs and the alcohol! But now I need to teach your cousin, this is the only way to stay away from those temptations! Not with approval, holding back laughter as best I can. Dinner ends with little issues, other than the random outbursts of slurred Greek from Papali. They turn on music in the restaurant, since the main crowd is coming, and we were kind of early for dinner. In a fit of excitement, Papali feels the need to dance. Not like a normal human being. No, no, that would be too simple for our hero. 85 year old man, 300 pounds with double knee replacements, decides to get on top of the neighboring table and dance on that. Oh nigga, what are you doing? Managed to get halfway on before my mum sprints in with my aunt to save the day. People sitting there are confused and are in shock, and this large elderly man flops onto the table like an artistic seal at SeaWorld. Brushes my mum and aunt off as they apologize profusely to the people. He gives no fucks and walks away towards the entrance, jazz hands up in the air and spinning and singing some Greek song. Another quality dinner. Another family gather. Barbecue time. Ham Planet Aunt, not from last story, decides to stop because free food. Everyone shows up with some food, including Nanny and Papali, with some dank Italian sausage. Aunt says, don't worry, I brought stuff too. Fucking two two liter Pepsis and a bag of Lay's. Not even fucking baked. Plebeian shit! I denounce their snacks and head to the table, where everyone is loading up their grilled meats of all kinds. Somehow, we got onto politics. Oh boy, here it comes. Family has many different economic backgrounds. I'm lucky enough to be lower upper class. Ham Plummet is feminist poor fag on disability. My rights. I think that people like me need more money from the government because we can't really work unlike most people who are just too lazy. I look around to make sure everyone else heard what I just heard. Continues on a rant while everyone just sits there feeling uncomfortable. Too bad our lord and saviour, the octogenarian himself, master of no fucks given, is here. Starts hitting his glass with a spoon. She beast continues her ramble. Starts hitting the glass louder and louder. Excuse me? She slams the spoon on the table. This man hates it when he is talking to every single person in a hundred yard radius isn't listening. Everyone is looking around and shocked and Nanny starts to yell at him. He proceeds to berate a circular maiden. How are you at all disabled? The only thing disabled about you is a logic portion of your brain. You can't be this fat and young and complain. I am an octogenarian and I have the right to be fat. Queen of Greece begins to get red in the face. Alicia to Medigon is about to pop. I'm not fat, I'm disabled. Learn the difference, you ignorant piece of shit. Papa Lee is confused, as he grew up in a time where if a woman talked back, they were shamed and sometimes beaten. He stands up and leans over the table, a smile on his face as he puts a finger in the air. Ah, I may be that, but at least I'm not disabled. Proceeds to flip a bowl of her chips into her, walking away. Just hands all the way to the door. Last night's D&D session. DM decides to reveal he's actually a bit of an amateur chef. Spends 10 minutes putting around in the kitchen, and we hear the constant churning noise of blender. Comes back with large mugs filled with a thick brown liquid. It's my cosmic brownie shake. Just try it. Try it. It tastes like sex with an angel. Everyone drains their mugs. Don't worry, there's plenty left. You can drink as much as you want. And the best part, it's actually really healthy for you. We start playing, continue to drink the tasty shakes the entire time. About an hour in, I start to feel funny. One guy dresses up to the bathroom, and a few seconds later, we hear him screaming. It's like snakes! It's like snakes are in my guts and they're tearing apart my asshole! No one has any idea what he's talking about. 
one minute later. Everyone knows what he's talking about. I managed to reach one of the three bathrooms. Pain. Agonizing pain. Like my liver is strangling my stomach while my intestines tie themselves into knots. I am shitting and crying and occasionally screaming. His screaming coming from outside the window. One guy didn't manage to get into a bathroom. He's screaming and crying and shitting outside in the backyard. Neighbors walk out of the house to see what's going on. Guy in the backyard is pleading with them to kill him. Everyone spends the entire night just shitting and crying. I just got back home and I think I lost 30 pounds. Gaming food thread? Be feminine. Move to a nice new neighborhood because of the school system, etc, etc. Becomes very close to my next door neighbor. We'll call him Dan. Hang out with him every day for years. Do dumb shit together, like playing PS3, play wrestling, or just running around the woods in our backyard like a bunch of tards. Dan is two years older than me, and was a total chad. But I liked hanging out with me, and he definitely elevated my social status. Fast forward a few years. It's my 13th birthday. Invite all of my friends from middle school, including Dan. We spent the night eating pizza, watching movies, and talking about the current middle school gossip in my basement. All of my middle school thought friends are all hanging all over Dan, but I don't mind. A few of my friends sleep over, including Dan. We'll all watch White Noise 2, a scary monster I received as my birthday present, and I eventually fall asleep on the couch while the movie is playing. Sleep.jpg In the middle of the night, after all of my friends have fallen asleep, I feel my sock slip off. Think nothing of it. A few minutes go by, and I'm about to go back to sleepville when I feel a wet sensation on my 13-year-old toes. Pick my eyes open just a little to see Dan sucking in my big toe with his mouth. Internally panicking, I don't know what to do. Uncomfortable as fuck, my heart is beating so loud that I'm surprised Dan cannot hear it. Does not feel good, man. Panics and lightly kicks him in the face and turns on my side, trying to pull him off like I'm still sleeping. After a few minutes, he comes back for seconds. His tongue has a gross wet sensation. At being 13, I didn't understand the sexual aspect of it. Kicks him again, harder this time, and fake stretches. As I'm doing so, Dan dives onto the floor and pretends that he is sleeping. <laughs> I stand up slowly, faking grogginess to go to the bathroom, still only wearing one sock. To this day, I'm convinced that he definitely knew that I was aware, and that he was awake and I knew what he had done, but for the sake, I acted aloof and oblivious. I come back from the bathroom and go to sleep on the couch. Dan is sprawled out on the floor. When I wake up, Dan is gone. My mom is making pancakes upstairs. I see him at school the following Monday and doesn't mention what happened or anything. I've never talked to Dan about this incident and it's been five years. This experience has haunted me forever. Time for a feels thread, you beautiful bastards. Be me. Ten years old when a group of cops show up at my house. Babysitter's freaking out. They're here for me. Mom and dad are dead. My life ended at 10 f***ing years old because of some f***ing asset with a .20 BAC. My uncle picks me up the next day. Moved to his place in another state. I feel constantly alone. I don't have friends, no enemies either. I don't even have any bullies. I'm so invisible to the world, I might as well be a part of the cosmic background radiation. Fast forward 12 years. 22 year old kissless beta loser struggling with depression. Still living with uncle. He's a good guy. Tries to point me in a good directions. Got me through high school and college. Even helped me land a decent job. Though, I lost it a week later. Can't fault him for my shitty life. The day after losing my job, he takes me to some sandwich place to try and cheer me up. Food's good. Always eat too much. We get a seat outside. It's a nice day. Random bump on the arm, and suddenly I'm drenched in ice water. This is my life now, JPEG. Look up and see a 9 out of 10 smoking hot Stacy apologizing empathetically. She's not looking at me. She's apologizing to the air. Seems about right. I don't even react. Even if it wasn't on purpose, I probably deserved it. Multiple servers show up with wants of paper towels. Feel bad for making them work harder than they should have for a loser like me. Stacy looks mortified. Still apologizing to the air. Looks like she's getting upset. Uncle kicks me under the table. Points at something she's holding. A walking cane? She's blind. I feel even worse. I pick up and apologizing for ignoring her. She reaches out unexpectedly and takes hold of my arm. The f fuck? She apologizes again for dumping her water on me. Reply, I'm used to it. Stupid, stupid, stupid! She smiles warmly. 
introduces herself. Her name is Jessica. Uncle offers her a seat. She can't, has to leave. Takes out her purse and pulls something out. Flails for a second and grabs my hand. Her skin feels so nice. Put something in my palm. It's her card. Tells me to call her and she'll make it up to me. Another Stacy appears. They lock arms. Jessica says goodbye, sweetly. They leave. Check out the card. It feels weird. Uncle says it's Braille. I don't know Braille. Pocket the card. No way I'm going to call, but it feels good to be treated like a human being by someone other than my uncle for once. Decide to save it for a rope day. A couple of weeks go by and my uncle sits me down with the we need to talk look. Just started a new job. Figure he's going to give me a rally speech. He's a good guy Greg. Has a knack for making me feel better. He tells me he took Jessica's car from my room. Tells me he called Jessica. The fuck you do bitch .jpg? Get this. He told her, a non's really shy, but if you get to know him, he's a really great guy. Lies and slanders or JPEG. Worse yet, they set a dinner date for that fucking night. Panic.exe. Took an hour to calm down. Start to think about my life. Haven't had a date in... ever. Take the first shower in a week. Put on deodorant. Remember hearing that blind people have super smell. Put on more deodorant. Drive shitty Ford Escort to the restaurant. Same place where she dumped the ice water on me. Figures. First contact is pretty awkward. She's even prettier than I remember. Five foot nine. Dark brown hair. 120 pounds. Lovely pair of D's. Yoga pants. Dad. Ass. She's already ordered, so I just ordered the house burger. She laughs. Feels bad, man, though, JPEG. Ask what's funny. She tells me she ordered the same thing. Says, we already have something in common. Suddenly feel that human connection thing. It's obviously a charity date, but she's pretty, and it feels good to smile. Decide to play along and enjoy the feels. Actually put forward some effort. I tried to tell some jokes. I'm terrible at telling jokes. She laughs anyway. Kinda feel like crying. Food arrives and I dig in. Food is always good. Then I realize, she can hear me eating. I feel gross. Swallow hard and apologize profusely. She smiles and then just starts wolfing down her burger. We're not talking quick little bitch bites with fast chewing. Oh no. We're talking jaw hinges open and half slaughtered calf enters the gaping maw of the toothy hell. This is how I died, JPEG. It pauses between mouthfuls. We start talking. Start to learn a bit more about her. Learn she's a foodie. Likes complex and artistic foods with flavors. Learn about her hometown. Small town girl. Learn she has a favorite color. Learn she wasn't always blind. She suddenly looks sad. Quickly change the subject. To me. Oh shit nigga, what are you doing to JPEG? Try not to be a loser for once. Tell her about my MBA. Don't tell her it took me three years to complete a one to two year degree. Tell her about my job. Don't tell her I basically babysit working teenagers for a living. Tell her about my childhood. Don't tell her about my dead parents. As a last ditch, tell her about my uncle. Don't fucking tell her about dead parents. Conversation feels good. Partway into the meal, she flails out and grabs my arm. Tells me she's really enjoying herself. Suddenly, I feel like crying again. The fuck is wrong with me? Before I know it, it's time to go. Too soon, PNG. She holds out a credit card for the waiter to take. Quietly swaps cards for mine. I'm not making a blind girl pay for my dinner. Besides, I know she only came out here as an apology. Waiter returns a minute later and hands me my card. Quietly have him hand hers back. I sign and tip the receipt. Waiter has her sign the customer copy. I expect her to bail and catch a ride any second to go home. Instead, she asks me to lay her out, waiting awkwardly in the parking lot. Expect someone to swing around to pick her up. Any second now. She asks if I forgot where I parked. Realize I'm her ride hometown. Remember the backseat of my car is filled with garbage. Probably smelly garbage. Remember blind people have a heightened sense of smell. Shit fuck the JPEG. I help Jessica into my car. I'm so nervous. I trap my keys. Twice. Get in. Start crappy car and start driving. Hot girl in car. Replaying data in my head. Wondering how badly did I fuck this up. 
completely distracted, go on autopilot, wind up driving home to uncle's house, turn car around, apologize. Remember Jessica was blind. Explain I went on autopilot and drove to the wrong house. Drive away. Try to make small talk. Start talking about family. About my dead fucking parents. Autopilot car across town to my workplace. Fuck. Apologize again. Then explain how I accidentally drove to work. Kill me dot now. Realize I have no fucking clue where she lives. I've literally been driving for 30 minutes without a destination. Ask her for her address. Go to put an address into phone's GPS. My battery's dead. Ask her for directions. Immediately regret asking a blind person for directions. Ask if I can borrow her phone. She hands me a flip phone. Immediately regret asking a blind person to borrow their phone. By this point, Jessica is stifling a laugh so hard it's leaking out of her phenomenal ass. We break down laughing. We laugh for a solid 10 minutes. Jessica finally calls a friend for help. A friend winds up giving us directions over the phone. We laugh all the way back to her apartment. Feeling much better by the time we get there. Feeling good enough about things to walk her up. She takes my arm and I escort her up her stairs. Strong pause outside. Out of nowhere, she tells me she knows I paid. How? She won't tell me. Instead, she put her hand out and touches my arm. Works her hand at my arm and touches my face. Wonder if she's trying to see me. Nope. Once she finds my face, she stands up on her toes and gives me a little kiss on the cheek. Tells me she had fun. Tells me not to make my uncle call next time. Enters her house. I stand there completely befuddled. Th there's a next time? Fast forward two months. In a case of unparalleled luck, I've managed to keep Jessica entertained for nine, check em, nine consecutive dates. Despite the fact she's totally blind, I make an effort to make myself a little more presentable. Join a gym. Start eating better. Buy clothes that actually fit. Shower every day. Focus all of my energy on making her happy. Learn a lot about her. For one, she likes to cook. For another, she has an awesome taste in music. Meet her friends, all of whom are pretty cool people. Learn how she lost her sight. All I can say is blunt force trauma when she was in her teens. She wanted to be a painter. She tells me it hurt for a long time. In the end, she chose to live with what she has. She has her family, her friends, and now she has me. Feels good to hear that. Makes me feel bad for being depressed all the time. Still don't feel worthy of her. Makes me feel like crying again. Tenth date rolls around. She calls out a two month anniversary. Feels good man, the JPEG. She's planning a nice dinner at her house. Food is always good. Ask me to come really early. Um, okay. Show up to Jessica's house an hour early as instructed. First time going inside. Nervous as hell and just other than food, I don't know what she has planned. Swallow fear and knock. She enters the door in a coat. It's June. The fucked up bat? Go in. House smells delicious, but it's pitch black. Can't see shit though, JPEG. She drags me around and pushes me into what I assume is a couch. Here's shuffling cloth. Something hits the floor. Might be a dinosaur. Still can't see. After a minute, she asks me what I think. Tell her it smells nice in here. She realizes the lights are off. Shit. Hear her walk across the room. Click. Better? Nope. Shit fuck. More walking. Click. Lights go on. She's standing on the other side of the room. In a red see-through negligee. Holy fucking hot to JPEG. Can you see now? Nope. I must have made her walk around her apartment, trying for light switches for like 15 minutes before admitting the lights were on the whole time. After she got over me ruining her surprise, we relaxed on her sofa. Still can't believe what she's planning. Tells me we have an hour before dinner will be ready. I'm nervous as hell. She looks incredible. Smells amazing. And feels... Ah! I am not too good enough for her. I want to tell her she's too good for me. I want to say she deserves so much better than I could ever give her. I want to admit I'm a virgin. She starts muttering in a sultry voice. Says that she's been looking forward to this for weeks. I say nothing. She stands up and pulls me to my feet. Slowly leads me over to the bedroom. I do not deserve this blind goddess. Fast forward another 10 months. Jessica and I have been spending a lot more time together. I've grown. 
I've managed to push my credit score high enough to get a decent place of my own. Kinda want to ask her to move in with me. Kinda want to ask her to marry me. Still a sad sack though. I figure I'll have to trick myself into proposing. House is still new. Jessica hasn't been over yet. I need to make it presentable first. I grew up hearing my mom tell me girls like it when boys keep a tidy room. My relationship with Jessica has taught me that blind girls require it. Organized like I have OCD. Secure and nail down everything. Duct tape all cords to the wall. Square up all the furniture and eliminate all tripping hazards. Find some nice looking wainscoting catboards with a wide lip on top that doubles as a handrail. Spend three days installing wainscoting everywhere. Buy a braille label maker. Braille labels everywhere. Label the inner lip of the rails with directions for getting around the house. Randomly print out, would you like to live here? Stick it to the inside lip of the random rails throughout the house. Spend all week getting my house presentable for the blind goddess. Finally ready. Invite her over for movie night. I don't own a TV. Show her around the house. Put a hand on the new railings. Start walking around the house. She's impressed. Success kid, the JPEG. Sliding her hand up along the lip. We're moving pretty quickly. She passes over invitation labels several times. Each time she pauses, but doesn't stop. Getting a little discouraged. Halfway down the main hall on our way back to the living room, she stops. Runs her hand back and forth several times. Starts breathing fast. Reads the trip a few more times. Slowly makes her way to me and leaps into my arms. <laughs> I did it! A year goes by and I barely notice a single day. Every day that I wake up next to Jessica is the best day of my life. I am the single happiest man in my own little world that revolves entirely around her. I still know I'm not worthy, but I don't think about it much anymore. I focus every ounce of my effort on making her happy. She deserves everything I can give her and so much more. That effort translates into every single faucet of my life. The world is a warmer, brighter place. One night, Tuzuka and I are chilling in the living room, listening to Harry Potter, her version of casual reading. It's just noise to me. I like to hold Jessica in my lap at night while she reads. I'm just happy to feel her in my arms. Sometime around 8, Jessica excuses herself to use the bathroom. A few minutes later, she comes back into the living room with a little paper bag. Not like a grocery bag. A nice bag. The kind you get at a specialty shop. It takes her a few minutes to get back to the couch. I've learned not to help her unless she asks. But waiting to know what's in the bag is killing me. She sits next to me with a very nervous expression. Tension that I see. She asks me if I love her. I empathetically tell her I do. Tell her that she's my world. She sits forward and pulls something out of the bag. Clutches it so that I can't see what it is. She holds it out in the fist like she wants to give me something. I go to cup her hands so she knows to let go. Before I can, she suddenly opens up her hand, dropping the thing on the floor. Shit balls to JPEG. I quickly crouch down and get on the floor, so it's desperately for what she dropped. Spot a glint of shiny metal, a little gold ring. Pick it up. Look at Jessica. She's standing over me with her hands outstretched and waiting. Reach out and hand her the ring. Our hands touch. She searches my fingers, feels the ring, screams, Yes! I'm on one knee. This is an engagement band. She tricked me! Fast forward six months. Jessica and I are the happiest couple I know. Her friends have become our friends. I have friends now. Feels good. Our friends call me her teddy bear. The girls think we're too cute together. And guys want to cut my dick off and have it bronzed. Okay. One day, my uncle comes over for a visit. He hands me a manila envelope. He says it's an early wedding present. Ask me to open it after he leaves. Jessica is out dress shopping, so we chill. At some point, he tells me that he's not my dad, but he's proud of me. And he knows my mom and dad are proud too. That night, I open the envelope with Jessica. It's my mom and dad's wedding photo. I haven't seen it in 14 years. Jessica says she wishes she could see it. Feel everything. Twelve years of pain washed away by a single glass of ice water. Two years of enduring bliss tripped at the finish line by a little irony. Tearfully say, they would have loved you. Finally start crying. Jessica and I are getting married tomorrow morning. I'm still not worthy of her, but I'm worth- Okay B, I have a grand story to tell. This is a Tard story. Not just any Tard story. 
the king of lost chromosomes. Tardalu, the master of sped. Be me. Go to a fairly large high school with no tarts. Note, all tarts went to another school near the next town over. In morning block, shooting shit about D&D &D and Warhammer 40k and shit. All students report to the auditorium. Went to the auditorium to get the higher seats we could find and avoid the <laughs> who sit at the front. Principal announces some changes to our classes. What to PNG? We have some new students joining us from another school district. All of these things, chambering chromosomal horrors and defects of the mind linger forth from the stage. Dear God, the JPEG. Roughly 30 of them. 10 roughly below 5'5 five five and extremely large. These will be known as the plague bearers. 12 who are fairly skinny, with autism and various disorders of the mind. They shall be known as harpies. 11 were of a normal downy variety, but they were more of the primal than others. These shall be known as the beasts. Now that's only 29 of the tarts. What about the last one? He, Tardalu, only one of his kind. 6'3", unbearable amounts of fat. Grease stained hoodie of the Minecraft creeper and noticeable beard. Unbearable stench. And never bathed, and he had two extra chromosomes. They put on a show in the stage, dancing and waving to their new buddies. They made their own song about being friends and shit. Tadella's voice is a low, downy grumble. My face went to see all these shamblers from another world. My face when the smell reeked into the auditorium. A plague bearer shat himself because of stage fright and was escorted to the baby changing station. Part 2 Tadello's first attack. B me. Currently in gym. Playing a type of soccer with swivel boards. You know the ones. Having legit fun and a good time. From across the gym, Tardalu and the three plague bearers walk in unattended by a greenhorn wrangler. Tardalu sees the magical game and bellows. Can I join? Greenhorn says no, they're exercising today. Tardalu genuinely pissed. His face scrunches up and his beard lifts up, revealing his folds in his neck beard. But I want to play! The elder rich replies. Greenhorn tries to calm him down, and says that it'll be fun getting healthy, and to lose a few pounds. As soon as she says, lose a few pounds, his anger was awoken. He unleashes a headbutt on a smaller, frail woman, and gives her a kick in the ribs with an audible crack. All froze when we sat, and were in total shock. He beckons forth his plague bearers, with a screech low and toying, but fearful nevertheless to unleash them. They rip off their shirts, and with their fat rolls bouncing onto the wind they charge. Lord help us, dog gif. They were unstoppable. Even when a titan of a coach stood against them, overwhelmed the titan, and continued chasing us with their foul stench. It is total fear and crazed violence. The plague bros continued to go for the stasis and fight the brats. School officer was called in to intervene and actually had to put handcuffs on a plague bearer. Tadalu was a legit throwing kids out of the way to fight brats. Outnumbered and overwhelmed, he surrendered. Greenhorn hauled to the ambulance and never came back. Part 3 Tardalo and the Harpies Tardalo used his harpies to spy on everyone and steal shit. Main harpy is an erratic spastic who constantly jitters in a zigzag motion while running. One day, I'm in math, learning geometry and all that shit. Hear the call of Tardalo. Oh shit, dot nignog. Harpies are following the main harpies' zigzags, while Tardalo is following, walking behind them. Harpies do a jump tackle and start crawling at normal fags. Panic breaks as soon as the call is heard. Teacher immediately, what the fuck is that what's going on? Harpy breaks into the classroom. Teacher asks to please leave. Harpy is dazed and immediately dolphin dives onto his desk, spazzing out. Teacher tries to grab the spaz. Spaz takes off clothes for tactical advantage to escape from his grasp. Spaz notices us and dies for a 6 out of 10 grill with large breasts. Rips shirt and proceeds to grasp coverted orbs. Grill fucking elbows him while he grabs her breasts. What it will smack as the Tard's head smacks the desk, and Grill covering her breasts. Tard scrambles on all fours, and does some dog run back into the hall, when Tardgarn apprehends him. Most harpies are pantless, being contained, roughly four, and Tardalu himself. Grill is absolutely scarred for life, and is crying yelling to look away, oh if I didn't, because free titties. For the rest of the day, school on high alert, and Grill was dismissed early. Part 4, At the Gates of Sped. In order to familiarise Tards, the lack of Wranglers, the normal students enticed to work in the unholy land unknown, as sped, with grade raises and overall alternative to punishment. I was late too many times to school, so I was given detention, or to work in sped. 
I chose the latter. During first block, I was sent to the gates of Sped. My god, the fear I felt as I walked in that room. My task was to work with a primal, to show him how to use an iPad. Showing the apps and Angry Birds and shit. All fine, till Tardalu walks in. He sits down with a few of the harpies and plague bearers. Primals are more social, but once angered, they can be an issue. Harpy's pointing at me, at Primal, with the iPad. Tardalu rubs his beard, using his blessed two chromosomes to put his brain to use. He orders a harpy to go over and introduce himself. Say, sorry, I'm working with someone right now. Harpy walks back to tell Tardalu, he is not pleased. Harpy walks back and takes the iPad from Primal. I try to calm down the Primal, and say chill out, I can get the iPad back. Harpy walks to the table where he is sitting. Tardalu makes eye contact with me and beckons me forth. I oblige and see to him. Hey, why did you take his iPad? Can I get it back? No, my IP. Get another one. Converse with him, saying he brought it if from home, there are no more. Visibly angry Tardalu. Locked. Open. What? Open. I can't op- Tardalu gets up, hits me in the face with the thin side of the iPad with an indescribable force. He lets out his call, and the harpies hold me down, and Tardalu comes forth, towering over me, Plague Knight occupying Wranglers. He pulls off his pants and rips off his undergarments. Bleeding, visually hazy, I accept my end. The primal, who I was helping, charges into Tardalu at the speed of Lovecraft's liver failing. Get away! Tardalu falls, and the ground shakes. The harpies fall onto the poor lad. Get the fuck out as fast as fuck, still bleeding. Feel like I'm in the Walking Dead escaping the horde. <laughs> Look at how they spelled horde. <laughs> I hear screeching and sounds of horror. I throw up and pass out in the hallway. Wake up in nurse's office with principal and staff surrounding me. Primal vogues for me and tells them that Tardalu attacked me. Sadly, Primal is sent back into his own realm, due to being the target of Tardalu. They give me a full two days off as settlement. Part 5. Shadow over Prom. Tardalu was going to be a guest at Prom. I was there too, just to assist the DJ and help with preparing food. We have a nice dinner before the dance of steak and asparagus. Tardalu in a t-shirt tuxedo and a suit coat, clearly a few sizes small. In the kitchen preparing food when a wrangler comes in, uh, hi, do you have mac and cheese? Think to myself, what the fuck? This is a prom. Through the kitchen window over the lunchroom, I see Tardalu with the other Eldritch gods. They are all clearly upset and sorrowed. Wrangler comes back in. They want mac and cheese. Can you go into the freezer and unthaw something? No, we can't go in there. The- Well, I'm saying it, so do it! Actual cafeteria chef says that it can't be done. We would have to know before. She knew her fate. I saw it on her face. She saw my wound, and I saw her eyes. She went back out to the Eldricks and said there was no mac and cheese. Tardalu eyes up Wrangler. For all that talk about her being dominant, it didn't help when you are whacked with a steel foldable chair like Hulk Hogan. Tardalu lets loose his call. All 30 of them arise from the surrounding tables and perform the call with him. They go into the deepest fit of madness. Head chef instantly what the fucking hard. HIDE THE KNIVES! He barks. We take our knives and throw them into the freezer to keep them out of the hands of the horrors. I see Tardalu. He is in a brutal combat with the Chads and Brads. His swing speed low, but his strength max. Multiple Brads gang up on him. He retreats to the snack table right by our kitchen. Takes the glass punch bowl after taking a swig and throws it at the Brads. Me and the chefs agree not to even go out into the madness. Four cups flood the dance hall, trying to subdue the Lovecraftian horrors. Tadalu loves out a moral boosting screech while the normies are hiding. I'm getting the fuck out of here, I said to the chefs. They all follow suit and we dash out the back door. Part 6 Tadalu and the Fish. This happened before the prom, but it's still a fun story. We went to an aquarium for marine biology stuff. Tadalu was dragged along because he wants to go. Staff reluctantly agree. We are on the bus ride over. When we get to the city, he says, and I shit you not, Wow! Tall trailers. My shekels are keckled. We are being led by our tour guide. He's jabbering on about whales and shit. We eventually hear, You're hurting them! You're hurting them! Stop! Teachers and students, what the fuck immediately? Tour guide rushes over to the touch tanks. 
Tardalo is ankle deep in the tank, grabbing the various scene life, and is either crushing them or consuming them. Five year old is crying, and smaller children are running away with their parents screaming at him. Tardgard was trying to get him to stop, till he punched him and knocked the wind out of him, so he was on the ground grasping for air. Security was called, and he overpowered one of the guards, but both took his arms and escorted him into the school bus. And that is why we never went on any field trips for the rest of my high school career. Part 7 Awakening of Azathoth I recommend listening to this without the Pui ego and prophecies. As Todalu racked up a lot of damage under his belt, he must have known that he would have been expelled. He decided to awaken a Tard War. He convinced 15 of the elders that the other 15 hated all of them and vice versa. The two sides hated each other and they would steal each other's shit and provoke one another. The boiling hatred between both sides gathered. Lunchroom tension would be so thick between the two sides. The day before April break, it was like any normal school day. In my third period classroom, history. Intercom bellows. All students remain where you are. Do not go out into the hallways. Everyone what the fucking until we hear screeches and brawling noises. Oh gods. Naked Tars run past the class with brown stain on his rear. We all go out to look to see this hell on earth. People flock to the entrance from the lunchroom. The horror. Feces stained, the broken tables, an iPad laid a few yards across down our door. Clearly bodily fluids sprayed across the wall. On a table, there he stands, the king chromosome, Tardalo, throwing turds away and absolutely doing in town. The horrors see us. The great ones bellows and points at us. 27 Tars come barreling forth into a small crowded hallway, covered in feces. A nightmare. The fear. The scramble. Tard on normal. Normal on normal. Tard on tard. Complete chaos. I begin swinging and punching anything fleshy. I get punched and kicked. Eventually, tards are on one side, sieging us. Imagine that scene from 300 where they are all defending. That was us. Wranglers and staff come to break it up. Too late. Roughly 70 students in that part of the hallway and other skirmishes. Tards uses plague bearers to break lines like cannon fodder. I begin to retreat and try to make my way to my car. Police in full riot gear trudge past me. Oh shit, not Get to my car. There's a paddy wagon right outside the cafeteria. Start up car and slip out of school. School had been closed for three days to clean. We can only have 50 students in the hallways at any given time. Tars were banished back to the homeworld. The gate of sped remained as if it was ready for more students, but remained empty with all the tar shit intact. As for Tardalu, I cannot say with certainty where he went. The hospital, back to Riley, to the trailer park, or wherever. He wasn't around anymore. No, I do not know where he lives. I don't know the things I have witnessed. The horrors. Greater than Dale the Tard. Maybe even Neil the Tard. I only know one thing. Preemptive, I'm gonna butcher this, but I don't give a fuck. Fignalu Maluk Tralaf, Tadu Riley Ralidnignav Flagon. Fuck it, I don't care. Close enough. <laughs> Brace yourself, guys, because you're about to read the incredible adventures of a guy I like to call Rodent Rick. Be me, 21. About a year ago, just started studying IT at a university. First week is pretty chill, just some introductions to all things around campus. We were about 500 students in IT class. Next week, our official first lesson starts. Friends and I are already late, so the only seats left are in the front row sit down next to some weird guy, but didn't pay too much attention to him because the professor was already scribbling things on the board. This was my first mistake. Pop up on my desk and immediately notice a strange liquid in it. I catch the guy on my left looking at me from the corner of my eye. Notice bite marks next to the liquid. Oh hell no! Dot gif. Someone obviously chewed on the table. Also notice a terrible smell. Ask my friend to stand up and move to another table. Then I notice it for the first time. The guy next to me made what I can only be described as an artistic meerkat mating noise. That's when I looked at him in the face for the first time and oh lord did I regret that. His nose was so crooked and curved that every Jew would be jealous of him. He wore glasses with 40 something diopter making his eyes bigger than his head and he had an overbite that could span the distance between English and France. Also his right ear. Someone told me later that it got chipped off at a lawnmower accident, but basically looked like someone hot glued a Cheeto to the side of his head. He basically looked like a retarded naked gerbil or rodent. That's why we started calling him Rodent Rick. It was obvious that he had some kind of mental health issue, but I didn't care. He wooded me out. 
After we moved two seats to the right, things got quieter, and I could concentrate on the lecture until this happened. Remember that SpongeBob SquarePants scene with the victory speech? Well, this guy stood up, and out of nowhere, let out the most screechy, squeaky victory speech I've ever witnessed in front of 500-something people. The entire lecture hall is dead silent. Professor dropped his chalk. Rink jumps over the table that exits the hall as if nothing ever happened, and I swear to god he winked at me before going through the door. This should only be the beginning. Some weeks pass, and everyone is talking about that strange kid who screamed during the lesson and just left. By the way, he didn't even pick up his stuff. His jacket, his backpack, and everything. He just left, and nobody's seen him since. My friends and I hang out with some other new kids after class. Someone says there was a break-in in the biology department this morning. Some birds got out of their cages, and some are still missing. I think it's just some stupid student joke. We go and get lunch in the cafeteria. God, I left me some spicy spaghetti. Suddenly, I hear a scream from the other side of the room. Can't say shit because of all the students. A girl runs past us towards the exit. What the fuck is going on to PDF? Get up and walk towards the other side of the room. See a small figure on the floor, gnawing on something undefinable. Colorful feathers everywhere. Lord have mercy, text. It's run at Rick with what seems to be the leftover carcass of a parrot in his mouth. Judging by all the teachers and the blood, he already ate most of it. Lunch ladies call security, and he gets escorted out of the building. He is now known as the weirdo who stole and ate a parrot from the biology department. He is expelled from the campus for five weeks, and has to pay the damage caused by breaking into the bird shelter by eating a rare Caribbean parrot. If you're not studying IT, I can tell you that being expelled from class for five weeks is basically a death sentence for this semester. Especially in the first semester, when you have to learn all the basics. But, then again, I don't know how he even got into this university in the first place. Five weeks pass as usual. Nothing out of the ordinary happens. Started chatting up with one of the only girls in her IT class. IT class gender ratio is about 95% male. We have roughly 10 women in 500 students. Also, 50% of students are absolutely stereotypical 4chan beta fags. Fat, and or hairy, and or smelly, and or socially awkward. Not a perfect 10, practically impossible to find in IT, but my Cobra takes what it can get. Let's call her Fiona. Fiona is what a super nanny would call an unsolvable case. She is an absolute rebel. Hates her parents, nihilistic all the way to the tip of her blue hair. Thank god for her Tumblr blog, it's not about feminism, which she finds ridiculous by the way, but helicopter parents and adult morals. Overall, a mini bane with parents issues. 7 out of 10. Not fat. Cute smile. Looks like Ramona from Scott Pilgrim Against the World. However, she is super friendly, and what's more important, she laughs at my jokes. Okay, back to the interesting stuff. Five weeks passed by, everybody thought it was the end of Rodent Rick, but we thought wrong. He started appearing in classes again, but aside from the occasional meerkat noises, he behaved pretty normal. Surprisingly, he didn't fail a single test. He had a better score than pretty much everyone else. He was under the top 10. It's winter now, and my friends, Fiona, some dudes and I start becoming a big group of 12 people. We do a lot of stuff together, like ice skating, fuck you, I don't care if it's gay, or going to the cinema. So, we decided to go and watch Interstellar. Scene 15. Entry road at Rick. He's sitting in the very front row of the almost empty cinema. Around him, a pool of popcorn. He's wearing a bag as a hat. We try to contain our laughter so he doesn't notice us. The movie starts, and with it to Rick's endeavor. For some reason, he is obsessed with Matthew McConaughey, because every single time he appears on screen, which is a lot of the times because he's a main character, he starts to squeal and mumble something unintelligible. Halfway through the movie, we notice a change in his behaviour. He's now quieter, and started to move around slightly. This better not be what I think it is, Don Obama. After the credits roll, we wait for him to get out and investigate what just happened. Instead of walking out of the cinema like a normal person, he walks up the stairs on all four legs. We go down to the first row, and immediately notice what is left over is Matthew McConaughey pleasure session. A bunch of wet tissues and stains on the seat. We left the cinema and walk towards the metro station. In front of the metro station is Rick, trying to mount a light pole. <laughs> it's already late at night, so nobody except for Rick, my friends and I, is on the street. Friends suggest we need to do something about this guy. Fiona feels sorry for him because of his mental illness. We decide that one of us should talk to him. Everyone looks at me. For fuck's sake, the bump. Slowly approach Rick and try to do some small talk. Realize I don't even know his name. Everyone just called him Rodent Rick or Gerbil. Initiate conversation with... Hey, um... You're in my IT class, aren't you? 
Rick stops dead in his tracks and starts sniffing in the air like some sort of mole. I'm not sure he's even noticed me yet. So, uh, I saw you in the cinema 15 minutes ago. Did you like the movie? Rick's eyes looked at me with these gigantic eyes and exclaims loudly, Shish, the movie's best movie I've ever seen! He's not Irish. His everybody just doesn't allow him to do the TH and the S sounds. So, uh, you need any help? A big mistake. Sure! Can you warm my noodly oodly for a second? I look down at him and catch his tiny baby carrot of an erection looking back at me. I turn around and just walk away. Get back to my friends and tell them we're gonna take the bus. Fiona. Wait, Anon, is he gonna be fine? Me. Yeah, he's definitely gonna be okay. Secretly hope that his penis gets stuck in the icy cold pole and the doctor will have to amputate it. Three days later, back at university. Lunch break. It's Taco Thursday. Which means tomorrow will be Arsehole Apocalypse Friday. Don't care. I love tacos. And apparently, Rodent Rick likes them as well. His tray is filled with tacos. He doesn't even have a plate on the tray. And he's heading straight for my table. What have I done to deserve this on HTML? He sits down next to me and immediately starts scratching the side of the taco with his two front teeth. What even? I'll just try to ignore him, but the stench coming from his direction is absolutely unbearable. Rick drops his taco for a second and scratches his ass. When his hand returns, it's covered in brown stuff. Almost have to throw up. But wait, it gets better. About five seconds later, he lets out the most inhuman scream I've ever heard. It's not like the SpongeBob screech you read about earlier. This hair-raising, glass-breaking, alarming scream. He completely undresses in front of the entire cafeteria, whilst rubbing his butthole. I just realised what is happening. It looks like the hand he scratched his butthole with had some extra spicy hot sauce, which is now melting its way inside his rectum. Rick is now completely naked, running around the cafeteria whilst fingering his ass with the good hand. Everyone is disgusted. Some girl is puking. But no one is actually doing something against or for him because no one wants to touch him. Rick finds the emergency exit and runs outside. That's the last I saw of him for those couple months. Apparently he got expelled for another five weeks. Some people said he studies from home by watching streams of the lectures somehow still passes all the tests. I never actually saw him take any tests or exams. Fast forward the summer. Rick is still the infamous guy who ate the parrot and pleasured himself publicly in the cafeteria. All the new students think it's just a myth the older students made up. Until one day before summer exams. Fiona and I, now my GF, are studying for the exams outside under a tree. When all of a sudden, a big limousine pulls up on the street. The back door opens. Out comes fucking Rodent Rick with the same shirt he wore when the last I saw him. I can't believe my eyes. He is now also wearing baggy pants. He waddles towards the entrance of the university like a fat black woman who waddles towards a fried chicken when we get up and follow him with some distance. The stench cloud he is dragging behind is rolling up my fingernails. Yep, definitely Rick. As he heads for the principal's office, we make a turn and go to our friends. After some research, we find he's actually the son of the richest dude in town. What the fuck? The guy ate a fucking parrot and is probably a millionaire. Amazed by this new fact, we go to our next class. 30 minutes into class, the fire alarm goes off. The whole university gets outside. Firefighters arrive. After 20 minutes or so, they're coming out again. One of them holds a slightly charred Ronan Rick in his arms. After the ambulance takes him to the hospital and firefighters take off again, everything slowly returns back to normal. That's the last time I saw him. Here's what apparently happened, as told by the lab guys. When we left the principal's office, he came by the chemistry lab. The lab guys are fans of sci-fi movies, so they have posters of different sci-fi movies in their labs, including one of Interstellar, which is Matthew McConaughey's face on it. Rick saw that poster and decided to burst into the chem lab so he could perform cunnilingus to McConaughey's face, whilst knocking over some highly flammable chemicals, sending him on fire during the process. The official version was Laboratory Accident. May he and his charred penis live in hell. God bless. We'll update as soon as I see him again. Sitting in a cafe after work one night, about 11pm, eating pizza and drinking coffee, walking in a proposal to upgrade my company's IT infrastructure, suddenly start overhearing a conversation. It's a little girl and the owner. The little girl is trying to scam a slice of pizza. The owner is a prick and is about to turn her away. Tell him I'll pay for a slice for her, and ask her to sit with me. Lol, I ran away. What the fuck? Ran away two days ago from another city and got this far, like 30 miles. She's been sleeping on public transport. She ran away because her stepdad's drunken rages got too much, and her mother won't defend her. Well, I'm not doing shit about this tonight, I thought. 
If I took her home, she's just gonna get an ass whooping if she's telling the truth. It's negative five degrees out here. Cobras freeze to death out there. The coat is thin as fuck. Ask her where she's sleeping tonight. I don't know. Maybe on a bus? Or in a park? Fuck. Ask if she wants to stop with me for the night. Really? Can I? Ah, oh, fuck it. Why not? Better I keep her safe, or I won't sleep tonight knowing she's out there. Pack up my laptop, put on my coat, and offer her my hand. She grabs my hand. Freezing fucking cold. The kid's cold to the touch. Her clothes are damp too, and they smell pretty bad. Get in the car. Put her in the passenger seat. Put the heater on. Look over at her at a stop sign. She's fast asleep. Take her into my apartment. Whoa, it's big and really shiny. Thank you, I like to keep the place nice. Turn the heating on. Shit, she's gonna need PJs or something. Hey, are you okay sleeping in one of my t-shirts? Okay. Wanna take a bath before I do? Okay. All right, I'll go run you a bath. Hand her the remote. Run bath. Use the bubble bath I sometimes use for shits and giggles. Bath's ready, Poppy. Leave your clothes outside and I'll wash them for you. Okay. A moment later, a naked filthy child runs past me nude. Um, do I put them there? Uh, nah, I'll take those. Enjoy your bath, kiddo. Can I leave the door open? Oh, alrighty then. I'll just be in the living room. Throw her clothes in the washer. 40 minutes later. Um, Mr. Anon? Can I come out now? Wash your hair? Yeah! Then come on out! Can you help me? Walk in. Open towel. She steps out into it. Wrap it around her. Go and sit on the bed. I'll rinse the tub. It's absolutely filthy in there. Like a layer of grime. That child was filthy. At least two weeks of grime. Tub rinse. Sit with hair dryer. Dry her hair and ask more questions. Her dad is basically a wife-beating, abusive drunk, and her mother is a pill popper, as well as a drinker. They sit around all day drunk. Neither have jobs. Neither have ever worked in her memory. She doesn't go to school. She eats junk food constantly. Her dad beats the shit out of her when he's drunk. Yeah, sometimes it gets really, really bad when he's angry. See? Cigarette burns and bruises on her neck. I'm not supposed to show anyone, though. Please don't tell anyone. I don't want to get in trouble again. Fuck's sake. Now what? Poppy, do you want to go back home? No! Please! No! Jumps out of the towel and wraps herself around me. She's shaking, and I don't know whether it's cold or fear. Mr. Anon, please don't send me home! I'll be good, I swear! Please, 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 please! Clings so hard, it's starting to hurt. No, Poppy. I mean, ever? Do you want to go home ever? Because I can't throw you back out there on the street and- Can I stay here? I was thinking of a care home. You can stay here tonight, Poppy, but we'll have a talk about it tomorrow. Come on, let's go. Let's go get you ready for bed. Finish drying hair. Put her in a pair of boxes that look like shorts on her, and a t-shirt that looks like a dress. Get out spare bedding, and set her up on the sofa for her. Then, sit with her watching TV, until she fell asleep. Took a shower myself, and went straight to bed. Wake up. Kid clinging on my back. Decide to get up and make breakfast. Move her clothes off to the dryer. Oatmeal, fruit, coffee. Call the kid. Put syrup in hers. Have breakfast, and ask why she was sleeping in my bed. I don't want to say... it's... you'll get angry. I won't, I promise. Do I look like the kind of man who breaks promises? Come on, tell me. I... Uh, I had an... accident. I'm really sorry, please don't be mad, please, I didn't mean to. She wet the... couch. Alrighty. Explains the lack of boxes. Yeesh, kid. I'm not mad. Come on. You can't help it. I'll clean it after breakfast. A bit of disinfectant, a bit of leather cleaner, and zap! All clean. Don't worry about it, kid. I'll help. I'm, I'm so sorry. Are you really not mad? Nope. Mommy always gets mad. She hits me when she finds out at home, so I sleep on plastic. It doesn't work always, but it kinds of works. Want me to sleep on plastic tonight? No, we'll figure something out. Good lord, what the fuck am I getting myself into here? I've acquired a child. What the hell is going on? Why.jpg? We clean the sofa. I put the sheets in the wash. She put her clothes back on. And oh look, it's time for me to visit my parents. Told my dad I'd go and help him clean the gunners on Saturday. And mom would know what to do. Come on, let's go out, Poppy. I need to visit my parents. Okay. 
Asked me questions the whole time we were driving. What my parents are like, what's my favourite food, colour, animal, month, time of the year, holiday, etc. Introduce her as my friend. Mom's what the fuck face tells me that this was probably an awful idea. My dad takes her to show her his aquarium while I talk to my mother. Tell her everything. It basically boils down to two options. Take her home, or phone social services, and tell them everything. Get her put into care, and start a lengthy process of finding her an adoptive home. We decide on social services. A care home would be bad, but not as bad as giving her back to her parents. Clean out the gunners with dad. Talk to him about the whole thing. He thinks mom's idea is best, but I should do what I think is right for her. But for me too. Tell them I'm going to think about it, and whatever I'll do, I'll do it Monday. Take the kid out for lunch. Buy her two sets of clothes and some PJs. Night undies too, like panties with padding. And I decide to make sure she pees before going to bed. Learn all about her parents. Basically, they're shitbags. They've abused her ever since she could remember. Apparently, she used to go to school, but her mother pulled her out when the teachers got suspicious and started homeschooling her. She doesn't have any friends, the house is filthy, there are rats, her parents spend all their money on booze and pizza, and her dad is a fucking ape. He once raped her mom right in front of her, by the description she gave me, one of her one-time stories. So, taking her home isn't an option. Decide to get my work done when she gets home. Turn on the Wii, teach her how to play Wii Tennis to wear her out. Discover what Nintendo really intended to do when creating the Wii. It works so well. She's pipped by the time my proposal is finished. Gotta get that raise and bonus. Booyah! Feed her a light salad with balsamic vinegar and grilled chicken. Give her water, put her in a bath, watch TV, dry her, get her ready for bed. Mr. Renon, now I have the special underwear. Can I sleep in your bed? Not tonight, Bobby. Sorry. You think I'm gonna pee in your bed? I won't. I promise. Please. It's scary in the big room by myself. If you're still awake when I finish my shower, we'll think about it. But for now, try and get some sleep. Shower, dry, get ready for bed. She's asleep in the living room. Lol, no on the bed thing. Go to bed. Ten minutes later, hear shuffling of a kid enter my room, and suddenly my back is warm. At least she's wearing pajamas. I hope I don't roll onto her. Fuck it. Bedtime. Okay, so somehow I've been giving you guys the day by day of this. Long story short, she went into care but I'm working on adopting her with my parents. She stayed with me for a week before I made my decision, and I got into a little trouble. She also stopped wetting the bed when she was with me, and it turns out it's anxiety triggered. She's also stopped calling me a nun, and now it's just, a nun. She also calls my mum, Nana. I also met her parents, and oh god, the people like them should not breed. Fucking scum of the earth. Tell us how you met the parents. <laughs> In the offices of the social services building, I've been designated Poppy's acting guardian, along with my parents, due to the failures of her parents, and they had come to argue their case with shelter workers. I'd been called in to give Poppy's side of the arguments, seeing as how she told me everything they did. They didn't have a right to know my name, and I didn't give it to them. I told them to call me Freezer, because, <laughs> lol, why not? I've been playing Budokai Tenkaichi 2 with Poppy that morning, and I kept picking Freezer because of the discs. She was Vegeta, because she likes going Super Saiyan. I digress. The first thing her mother did was stand up and spit at me, and call me a sick, twisted bastard and a homewrecker. I took great pleasure in tearing them apart, in Poppy's name, along with the social worker, and right at the end, when Miss. Social worker turned off the tape. I looked into her father's eyes and said, You'll never see, scream at, burn, or hit that child again, you drunk ape. People like you don't deserve children. Or air. And he kicked the chair at me. Hit the social worker, and landed them deeper in shit, because he showed he can't control his temper. This was the first and last time I ever met them.